Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now, it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We all certainly appreciate your presence. Glad you came to the house of God. Beautiful day God's given us in which to worship. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the coming hour we can be an inspiration to you. Now the message today will be on tape num number 148. Number 148, the singing and the message will be on this cassette tape. And they're available for a gift of $3 or more to help pay for radio time. I want you to pray for us and write to us. We'd like to hear from you next week. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. You write to me, and I appreciate it. We covet your prayers as we sojourn for the Lord. This is a home mission work, a ministry of love. We're trying to get out the gospel. We visited our couple last week on the way down to Everton that shut in. Most of the time, they can't go out to church, and they said, Preacher Edwards, we enjoy the broadcast so very much since we can't go to church like we'd like to. Well, that's the purpose for it. The reason we have this Sunday morning ministry to reach those that can't be in God's house. Many dear elderly people, many people shut in, some in hospitals, some in rest homes and various places, and we can carry the gospel to them. And I appreciate the privilege of having the opportunity to do that and we work us together in getting out the gospel. Now today, if you have your Bible, turn, will you please, to uh, some two or three places in the Bible. Turn, first of all, to Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts chapter 2. We need today some people that are really concerned about the things of God that put forth every effort to be in the work of the Lord, to be in the house of God. Sometimes God's people are prone to be careless in this respect. You know, the word... Uh, Fan came from the word fanatic. We need some more uh, Christian uh, fanatics, so to speak, or fans to the glory of God. People go out to places of worldly pleasure. They pack out the football stadiums. They yell and holler for their sport and many times their God. But sometimes God's people are a little slack and concerned, unconcerned about the things of God. I'm reminded this year, football fanatic. He was in the stadium one Sunday afternoon watching his team play. There came a funeral procession by the stadium. And when he saw it coming, he stood up and took his head off and laid over his heart. A man sitting nearby him said, I didn't, I didn't know you was that kind of a fellow. He said, well, she had been a real good companion to me for 40 years. And this is the last thing I can do for her. Now, you'd call that, I guess, kind of fanatic. Reminded the man that sitting by the roadside when this funeral procession came along and they had a brand new hearse leading the way. I mean, it was a shiny job. He looked at his friend and said, boy, I'm telling you, that's real living. And so sometimes we uh, kindly put our emphasis in the wrong place. And if we do it to the glory of God, then we can get more accomplished for the Lord. Now, I'm giving you time to find the place. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 Turn right over to verse 42. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. All that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having faith with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. If you notice there, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily. Now I want you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 16, page 1021 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Act of Matthew chapter 16. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now in order to really get what it means here, we need to go back and look at verse 
13 through 16 of Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and other Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice the testimony of Simon Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjoner, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now if you notice here, Jesus said upon this rock. Now he's talking about the rock that that out. And the church is not built upon Simon Peter. You have a major religion in the world today that's uh, greatly in error and paganism and so forth that uh, believes the church is built on Simon Peter. But that's not true. To teach that is teaching error. That is absolutely false. The church is built upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the great foundation. Now I want to read another verse or two found in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, page 1251. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He tells us here that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Therefore the church is built upon him. Verse 21 in whom all the building fitly, all the building fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. Now he's talking about the church being built and fitly joined together. I want to speak to you today on this line of thought, seven things concerning the New Testament church. Now the church is a building and fitting together. And the Holy Spirit fits each believer into the building of the body of Christ as it pleases Him. Now upon this earth you have builders, you have carpenters and builders that can build buildings and fit them together. That you can hardly tell where they're joined together. That's a gift. Bezalel in the Old Testament was given that gift to build the things pertaining to the tabernacle. And you have men today that are gifted in building. Now my son is a cabinet maker and a carpenter and, and he builds beautiful cabinets. And you can hardly tell where they're joined together. Very beautiful. I'm not bragging on him because Paul is my son being such a good cabinet builder. But I'm telling the truth. He builds beautiful, beautiful cabinets. Now I couldn't do that. I couldn't build a building. I couldn't build a cabinet. Now my wife gets awfully nervous whenever something goes wrong in the house and I grab the saw and the hammer and the pliers and the screwdriver. She follows me right behind me, very nervous because she knows I usually always tear up three things in trying to fix one. Now she'll say amen to that because I am not a builder. And she'll say, why don't you just leave that alone and let me call Paul? Well, you know, I want to kind of be a fixer myself, you know, and and then I'll go in and tear up three more things and Paul has to come fix four. Now that's the way it is. Now God is building the church and God is placing in the church uh, the church, the, the people as it fits in. Now if it's left up to me to fit the people in the church, I would fit them in various places. Somebody always grumbling about something, I'd put them by the coin on the little toe and other things like that. I'd, I'd really fix up the church that's left to me according to the way the people act, the way they live, but not the Lord. The Lord is the one that fits each believer into the body of Christ as it pleases Him. He can fit it in there, and it works out exactly and fits in exactly like He wants it. Now, you must keep that in mind. You don't have to say so as to where God wants to put you in the church. God places you exactly where He wants to place you in the church. Now let's mention first of all the founder of the church. Now the Lord Jesus Christ himself founded the church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. 
Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now Jesus founded the church. He's the builder of the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, you're God's building. And so when the Lord builds the church, then you know God is building a church that pleases Him. Amen. Now I'm talking about a true church, a group of born-again believers. Now many times we call the building the church, and the reason we do that is because the building is where the church meets. Now we can leave this auditorium here this morning and move out the door and not be one person left in this building and this would not be the church. The church would be on the outside getting ready to go home probably. But when we all meet together, we're the church. We belong to the same group. We belong to the Northside Baptist group and the Baptist church. We come here and we meet in the building that we call the Northside Baptist Church building. But the building here is not the real true church. The real true church is made up of true born again believers. And the Spirit of God places them in the body as it pleases the Lord. So Jesus Christ himself founded the church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Future tense. When he made that statement, of course, the church had not begun because Jesus said, I will build my church upon the rock, upon the rock Christ Jesus, implying the church was yet in the future, and it was. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, is the head of the church. He's the chief foundation. And, of course, it's built upon Christ, the head, Christ, the foundation, Christ, the solid rock, and then the apostle, somewhat the uh, foundation stone, so to speak. And God built the church on the day of Pentecost, God brought all believers together and there he baptized the believers into one body. That's the real beginning of the New Testament church as we know it today. Now to be very technical, it had its beginning with Christ and the apostles, but it was brought together into one body on the day of Pentecost. That was the purpose for the Spirit of God coming that he might bring together all true believers and indwell them and remain in them until God called them home. And then every person saved after that was added to that body that had its beginning on the day of Pentecost as a New Testament church in the way we know it. And so the New Testament church now is almost 2,000 years old. Now God will finish and complete this temple which is called the church. And when God completes the temple it will be over. The church age will be over. But God is not through yet. Today, somewhere in this world, God will add some more little pebbles to the temple. He'll add some more people to the body. He'll continue to build upon the temple. The Holy Spirit of God is doing that. And so it had its beginning as we know it as a New Testament church on the day of Pentecost. Now, number two, let's notice the founding of the church. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41... Then they that glad to receive his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, baptized into one body all true believers that were saved at that time, and then began to add to them a great number on that particular day, that was added unto the church 3,000 believers. The Spirit of God placed in the body of Christ 3,000 believers at that one particular day. And they were baptized. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therewith with thanksgiving. And so we're rooted in Christ. We are placed in him. We are built up in him. As God builds the body. So God founded the church. And then those people there in Jerusalem. Went out from house to house. Witnessing for the Lord. Some went back to the own country. Witnessing for God. And there as they would witness. Souls would be saved. And each saved person would be added to. The body of Christ. Now almost 2,000 years later. You that are sitting out here. And you in the radio listening audience that are saved. You too have been added to the church. That had its beginning on the day of Pentecost. As we know it as a New Testament church. God has added you to it. 
The church is the body. Christ is the head. And God will catch out the body to meet the head. And the body and the head will be together. And we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ. And so number three, let's notice the foundation of the church. Here in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 to 18, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now they were discussing about who was this man Jesus. Or where did he come from? Isn't that Joseph's son? Where did, uh, or who told him that he had authority to do and say certain things? Is that not the carpenter? I was referring to my son uh, just a moment ago about uh, being a cabinet maker. And uh, when he went into the business, I said, son, you're in an honorable business. Because the Lord Jesus was a carpenter. He was a builder. And he was called the carpenter. And he worked in the carpenter shop with Joseph, his foster father. And there they worked together. Sometimes I wondered how many G houses Jesus helped build and repair. And how much funny to her that he helped make it his day as a little lad growing up. He'd come to the carpenter shop there with Joseph and they would work and build certain things. Back in those days, I understand that people would bring their broken chairs and their broken tables down to the carpenter shop and there they'd be repaired. And so he worked there as a child growing up. I don't think his father had to fuss on him, that is Joseph. I don't think he had to recommend him for anything that he did wrong. I think everything Jesus did was right. And he worked and labored there with his father, which was an honorable thing. And he was a builder. But he was getting ready to do a greater building. And that was to build the church. Out in the future, he knew that must be done. And the church built upon him. And he said, Simon Peter, and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not um, revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, which is uh, Petros, a little stone. Uh, Simon Peter himself said in one of the epistles that we are the little stones in the building. He said, You are a little stone, Simon. But he said, upon this rock, upon myself, upon the testimony that you gave that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build this church. Nobody has ever been added to this church that denied that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Yesterday, well, my wife said a couple of uh, Russellites came to our door. I wasn't there. And uh, these Russellites came, of course, with their poison literature. And uh, the poor old deceived souls on the road to hell they don't believe in. And they came to the door and they said, we are uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. The only thing about it is it's not true. They're the devil's witnesses. They're not Jehovah's Witnesses because they deny that Jesus Christ is very God. They don't believe Jesus Christ is God. Now, anybody that denies that Jesus Christ is God cannot be placed in the body of Christ they are not saved. They will not go to heaven. They will die and burn in hell forever. Now, beloved, listen. These poor deceived people deny that Jesus Christ is God. Therefore, there's no salvation for them. When you deny that Jesus Christ is God, deny he's the Savior, then there's no hope for you. You can't be saved denying that because that's the only way any person can be saved. Jesus said, if you believe not, I am he, you shall die in your sins. So when these poison peddlers, these Russellites and Relaphodites come around your house with a poison leader to her, put them in the road. They don't deserve any respect whatsoever because they're poison peddlers denying Jesus Christ as being God and they've been deceived by false prophets and they follow the blind leaders and they'll all go to hell according to the Bible. It's pathetic. You don't owe them anything. You don't even owe them any respect whatsoever. Uh, as a religious person, you might respect them as a human being, but put them in the road and send them along and waste no time on them. They trot around your house on Saturday. They'll trot around your house on Sunday morning when they think uh, the head of the house is in church and try to deceive the rest of the family with their poison doctrine. If they can't uh, try to get you to uh, see their way, they'll try to leave you some poison littered to them. Don't, don't take it. If you take it, burn it as quickly as you can get it. Burn it by the time they get out of the yard good. Beloved, have nothing to do with that a bunch of poison peddlers 
If you do, you might be guilty of sending somebody to hell. If you're not saved, you may go to hell yourself. Jesus said, I'll build my church and gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the devil will never be able to prevail against the church. It's safe. Somebody said sometimes, well, I believe the church is going down. The church is not going down. Beloved, the church is safe. There's no member of the church will ever be lost. No member ever. Now, the churches may be uh, uh, lacking in attendance as they once were because you have so many that were not saved that came to church and then they fell away and went back out in the world and some of them sitting at home today. Some of them got their names on this church row. Listen to me right now. They've never been saved, chances are. And they fell away. But the real true church is going to stand true to God and the real true church will never go down. Only believers that they pretend to believe that join the church were baptized, fall away, and backslide on God. Now there may be a few of them saved, but if there are a few of them saved, then sooner or later God will deal with them because of their disobedience. Now the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, to build upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now notice number four, the, fa the fundamentals of the church. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Now the word of God tells us here that they went forth with the apostles' doctrine. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and let's find out just what that doctrine is all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, page 1225 in my Bible. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and so forth. Now there you have the doctrine, the gospel, the fundamentals of the faith, preaching a death, burial, and resurrected Christ. And so that's what they did. That's the fundamentals of the church. Believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believing in the deity of Christ. Believing in the second coming of Christ. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, And they gladly received the word were baptized. They that glad received the word were baptized. They worshiped, they fellowship, and they gave of their means to promote the gospel in that day. Barnabas sold all of his belongings and brought it to the church and gave it to the church for the spreading of the gospel and feed the poor and so forth. They supported the work of God. They worshiped, they sang, they prayed, they witnessed, and moved forward giving out the fundamentals of the faith. And then we come to thought number five, and that is the zeal of the early church. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Here you have the zeal of these believers. They went everywhere preaching the word. Everywhere carrying the gospel. I mentioned a moment ago about these uh, Russell and Rephidites. Now they'll get out with their poison doctrine. And they'll go everywhere trying to get out that doctrine. And they'll stand on the street corner in snow and rain and give out that poison literature. Now, if God's people had that kind of a zeal, we could get more people to God, get more accomplished. Amen. But God's people uh, don't have that kind of a zeal. They should. And that ought to put us to shame to know that these false teachers and uh, witnesses of Satan are out there giving out their for, uh, false doctrine. And they have the zeal to do it. Now, one reason they have such zeal to do it, one reason to do it, they have no opposition from the devil. Now, the reason the church don't do it like they should, they have opposition from the devil. Now, that group has no opposition from the devil whatsoever. He helps them along and encourages them along. But when you go out to give out the truth and witness and give out God's word, you're going to immediately have opposition from the devil. And that's one reason so many of God's children don't do it when they should do it, should be a witness on their jobs, in their homes, in their community. And so they had great zeal. They went out on the Great Commission. They went everywhere. They went preaching. They went witnessing. 
They warned people of Jesus Christ and they baptized their converts. And there they established uh, local churches in various sections of the world in those days. Number six, notice the success of the early church, Acts 4, 33. And with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection and the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. They were united in their message and they were willing, they were willing to serve. Now this matter of serving God has to come from a willing heart and a willing mind. If you don't do it willingly, you might as well not do it. If you do it against your will, you might as well not do it. If you give of your tithes and offerings to support the work of God willingly, well and good. If you give it against your will, you might as well keep it. And God wants what we do for him be, be done will, willingly, according to the Bible. Then we come to number seven, the great incentive of the church. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35, said, let's, let's, you gir, Lord, uh, gird your loins about with the light and be a burning fire for God. Not exactly those words, but that's the meaning of that. Read Luke chapter 12, verse 35 through 38 and verse 43. He's telling us that, that we should be a shining light for the Lord. Getting the light out into places of darkness. Telling people about the Savior that's able to save them and do for them that it needs to be done. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the Bible said, For they themselves show us of what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So he tells us something there about the city of the church, how we need to get out and do the job for God. Now the church is a very important institution, very important organization. And God planted the church. God established the church. God approved the local church. A local church consists of the bishops, that is the preacher, the deacons, and the saints, or the, the, Christian, the members, the Christians. They constitute a New Testament Baptist church. I would not want to live in a land where they had no church. Now you go to some of these lands today that's dominated by uh, communism and Catholicism and see what kind of shape they're in. It's pathetic. Starving to death by the millions. People down in Ethiopia today are starving to death every day by the thousands. Dominated by communism. You go to South America, Spain, other places, dominated by this paganistic religion and by communism and see what's happened to the people. I would not want to be in a place where there's no real, true, local, Bible-believing church. I wouldn't want to be in a nation where they had none. Therefore, God expects us to be faithful in getting out the gospel, faithful to our church, faithful to the cause, because the church has done wonders for America. The reason God has blessed this nation beyond measure is because of the Bible-believing churches and believers in this land. We support more missionaries than many other nations put together. We feed and help more poor nations than other nations do. And God has blessed us and we help the Jew. And God has blessed this nation. That's one reason God has spared America and God has blessed this country beyond measure because of the gospel the believers, the true churches, the missionaries, the supporting of missionaries, the helping of underprivileged nations and people, and God has blessed us for it. You ought to love the church. Stand by your church. Get your family in the church. You ought to do that. That's your responsibility. Let me give you these stats and I close. Some of you heard me give them before, but I want you to see two families, one that believed in the church and kept his family in the church, the other did not believe and see what happened. In the early part of the 18th century lived Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes. Max Jukes was an atheist, lived a godless life. He married an ungodly girl. And from the union, there were 310 who died as paupers. 150 were criminals. Seven were murderers. 100 were drunkards. More than half the women were prostitutes. His 540 descendants cost the state one and a quarter million dollars. That was a family of Max Jukes. He didn't believe in the church. He didn't go and didn't take his family. On the other hand, Jonathan Edwards, a great preacher, believed strongly in the church. Jonathan Edwards, a man of God, a great American, lived at the same time of Max Jukes. He married a godly girl. An investigation was made of 1,394 known descendants of Jonathan Edwards, of which 13 became college presidents. 
65 college professors, three United States senators, 13 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 Army and Navy officers, 100 preachers and missionaries, six authors of prominent prominence, and came uh, won, won a vice president of the United States. 80 became public officials in other capacities. 295 college graduates, and among the whom were governors and states missionaries to foreign countries. His descendants did not cost the state a single penny. He believed in the church, and he believed in God. Now that's the difference. Now you make your choice. The church is invaluable. The church is important. And you owe your allegiance to God and his church to stand by and serve the God faithfully. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. And thank you for the church of the living God. The gates of hell shall never prevail against it. And thank you, our Father. We know that is true. Have you in this invitation? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us a stanza or so. And if you're here this morning and you need to come to the altar here for any reason, get saved, come back to God, join the church, where the case may be, I want you to feel free to walk down the aisle, and we'll gladly help you if you'll come while she plays. Would you come if God is speaking to your heart? Would you come?